Hi, everybody, and welcome in. We're happy to have you here at the Kumo Theater. We've had some great speakers throughout uh, yesterday and today, and we're going to continue this afternoon with some more terrific information. So please welcome to the stage from Victor Ops, Matthew Beckman. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is CloudWatch Contextual Alerting, uh, real-time alert transformation and routing, and I am Matthew Beckman. A little bit about me, I'm a developer advocate with Victor Ops. I've been running operations teams as part of and alongside our developer friends for the better part of 20 years. Uh, the last 10 of that, I've been focused on highly transactional e-commerce systems, uh, which as you all know, have very low tolerances for outages. Putting all that together, I've been on call for about 20 years and helping incident management teams get better at managing incidents and sleeping through the night is something I'm deeply passionate about. I'm also the author of the DevOps Guide to Incident Management. So if this is a topic that you're interested in and you want to learn more, uh, that's a free ebook that you can download on the VictorOps website. A little bit about VictorOps, just to set context for who we are. Uh, VictorOps is a DevOps incident management platform, or an incident management platform really built for DevOps teams. If you take a look at this graph, everything on the right side of our logo is what you care about. It's your stack that you're monitoring, and then all of the systems that you're using to monitor that stack. We'll take those alerts and ingest them from really any monitoring system you might have and apply all of the necessary logic associated with scheduling, teams, rotations, alert routing, and notification to make sure that your incidents arrive at an incident responder's phone, Slack channel, email, uh, carrier pigeon, whatever uh, notification you want. We also provide a really robust co collaboration and communications platform for teams that have adopted chat ops or who are starting to look into chat ops so that your teams have a simple place to collaborate as they troubleshoot the incidents that they're working. And then on the backside of all that, we have a really robust reporting and analytic system that enable you to get insight into how the team is performing uh, as, they, as they troubleshoot incidents. So a different way to look at that is any modern engineering team is going to have lots of different monitoring systems in play. You might have Prometheus or Graphite that are out there gathering metrics. You might have AppDynamics for application performance monitoring, Nagios for static, Splunk for log analysis. Certainly, if you're here, you probably have CloudWatch alerts in your ecosystem. And every single one of those uh, different applications has notification logic. You can send an email from the back of Splunk, and you don't need VictorOps for that. But as an engineering team, having to re-implement notification logic in every single system is a real drain on your resources. And that's what we do for you, is we enable you to offload that uh, notification logic to us and give you a central place to manage and, and see, uh, have transparency into how all of those functions work. And that's actually this slide, sorry. So notification logic schedules, rotations, escalations, and chat ops to your on-call team. One of the things we like to encourage people to be thoughtful of in incident management is that there's really five phases that you have to be aware of as you're troubleshooting uh, your systems. The first phase that we talk about is detection. This is a system or a person becoming aware of the problem. Some metric has passed a threshold. Somebody has noticed there's a spike in customer support requests. Whatever that element of detection is, that's the first phase. The second phase is response, and this is inclusive of notifying a responder that something has gone wrong, and then that responder getting their laptop open, logging on, and the initial steps of diagnosis and understanding the problem set. The third phase is remediation. This is where we're actually going to solve for what's wrong. Uh, apply a fix, roll back a change, somehow or other remedy uh, the incident. Now, if you ask anybody, what is incident management or what are the phases of incident management, they're going to give you those first three kind of top of mind. But something that I think is super important is to be very mindful that there are, in fact, two other phases that to be successful you have to spend time and effort against. The fourth being analysis. This is where we're going to do a post-incident review, sit down and understand the causal or contributing factors to an incident. And last, perhaps most importantly, is readiness. Let's learn from that and do something about it. Let's improve our systems, apply changes to prevent this from occurring in the future. Let's practice through game days and have a shared learning culture to get better at incident management. If you talk to really anyone who's on call or who's managing operations teams, this metric is the one that I think we can all relate to. Mean time to recover, mean time to repair. Um, when you look at that across our five phases, 
most teams spend the vast majority of their time in those first three phases, detection, response, and remediation. And all of the human elements of on-call and operations live in response and remediation. So if somebody comes to me and says, how can we get our team better at incident response and how can we reduce our time to repair, I want everyone to focus on those two areas, response and remediation. The sooner you get the alert to the right person or team, and the sooner that person can understand the context of the issue and resolve it, the better off you are. And then of course, everybody, uh, the more time we spend there, the less time we're able to spend in analysis and remediation, or excuse me, readiness. So with that context, let's sort of jump into CloudWatch alerting. And I imagine everybody's seen an alert similar to this. Um, I think what's great about CloudWatch alerts is that you get a great deal of insight into metrics across your AWS environment. But I think that my critique of CloudWatch alerts is that they're data heavy and they're information light. So as a responder, I get this at 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, I see the last couple of data points associated with this threshold. That's great. I can click a button and get into it but I really don't know where this database sits in the environment. I don't know any of the contextual information that I need to really troubleshoot it. I'm starting from scratch. So let's contrast that with a transformed alert coming out of VictorOps, where we've taken the same alert out of CloudWatch. We've reformatted it, first of all, just to be pleasant, more pleasant to look at, a better user interface. Uh, but we've added additional context. In this case, we've thrown a link to the runbook associated with all CPU utilization alerts. And we've added a graph that shows that alert uh, over time. This graph is coming out of a Grafana uh, dashboard. And then the runbook is just off of a, a wiki. We still have the link to CloudWatch. It's a little bit more information. The difference between these two may seem slight. But at 3 in the morning, the ability to click a link and immediately get to the relevant documentation associated with an alert can really be impactful in reducing that time to repair. We do all this through a feature called the transmogrifier. Um, it's a great name for a feature, but really what it allows you to do is annotate all of your alerts with images, links, or text. It allows you to overwrite alert fields or add new fields. So any alert payload coming out of Splunk or CloudWatch or Nagios has got a ton of metadata associated with it. And the transmogrifier allows us to modify any of those fields, which can then be used to drive additional context or define other secondary escalations or routing mechanisms. As just a start, what's nice about the transmogrifier is it allows you to add context to all of your alerts. So if you have a landing page for all databases in Confluence, you can put this in one place, and now any alert coming from Splunk or CloudWatch or any of your monitoring systems has it. But what we have here on the bottom is the advanced features, and this is where things get particularly interesting. So this is actually the, the configuration screen uh, used to show the, uh, the modified alert previously. Uh, and what we're doing at the top, first of all, is we're just defining the if condition when the routing key, which is one of the metadata fields in our alert payload, matches AWS, which is our, our, my arbitrary uh, definition of that key, then annotate it with these additional, cloud, uh, these additional things. So first of all, we have that link to CloudWatch. Second of all, we have the link to the runbooks. Lastly, we have the image being inserted from Grafana. And then we have delivery here at the bottom as we annotate some of those additional fields. We're setting a Slack channel to our ops channel so the ops team gets it. And we're transforming that uh, the name of the alert, state host in our case, to what we got out of CloudWatch, which is uh, trigger.dimension.0.value. And what you can see, and, it's, and I apologize, it's a little bit cut off, but in those uh, first two uh, links, you start to see the variable substitution that we're using to construct those URLs. So what this means is if you as a team have adopted conventions across your naming schemes and across your deployments, you can use those conventions that are present in your monitoring configurations to drive dynamic uh, insertion of data into your alert streams. This is where instead of a link to a generic runbook, you can have a link to a runbook associated with a specific instance or a specific service or a specific anything in your environment. So here we've taken the incoming fields from CloudWatch, trigger.dimension.0.value, and mapped that to an instance ID. And we've taken alert.entityDisplay name, which is the name of that CloudWatch alert, and linked that to the aggregated uh, dashboard and service in, in, uh, in our runbooks. And really, we have a very rich data set to operate on from CloudWatch. Uh, this is a couple of snippets from all of the payload that we get out of a CloudWatch alert, any one of which can be used in the transmogrifier 
to not only drive this additional context that I'm talking about, but to help route uh, any of these alerts to different teams or to have different alerting and routing rules trigger based on those data, but based on those values. So underpinning all of this is a, a thing that I think uh, I encourage everybody to be really thoughtful of, and that's that runbooks are probably the easiest and most impactful thing you can do for your team to help them reduce overall time to resolve. I think of living in today's world where DevOps grows and we have new people joining on-call rotations, we have developers joining uh, responsibility or uh, accepting responsibility uh, for systems that they're not familiar with. And the best way to set them up for success is to provide them a how-to, to give them some context, and then to deliver that context with the alert. So great runbooks, first and foremost, provide clear explanations of a system metric and alert threshold. Uh, I've personally uh, been woken up more times at 3 a.m. with an alert that tells me that some threshold has been passed on some system that I have no familiarity with. And the amount of time it takes me to dig in and understand what that is negatively impacts the time to resolve, and maybe personally, more importantly, negatively impacts my own sleep patterns. Great run books, second of all, clearly identify the dependencies in our systems. You may get an alert for a particular database and think, let's restart it, but without being mindful of the other consequences up and downstream of that system, you may have just taken a simple problem and made it a great deal worse. I think secondarily, uh, great run books clearly identify subject matter experts. So if you're working the problem, it's 3 a.m., you're doing your best, who should you escalate to? Should not be an exercise in digging through the company directory. It needs to be present in your run book so the team can quickly escalate to the appropriate, uh, the appropriate SME. And then lastly, great run books help those, those on-call responders understand context in a historical sense. So what is the incident history associated with this? Does this alert fire every week on Tuesday at midnight? Is this the first time this alert is fired in the last six months? Helping that person understand that alert in broader context similarly helps guide their diagnosis and their eventual remediation efforts. And lastly, they list known failure conditions. If it's a frequently recurring problem that we somehow or other have not automated away, give that person a process that they can easily kick off to solve the problem without having to engage cognitive processes in the middle of the night. So to bring all this home to, to the, the core metric that we started with, that's our time to resolve. When we actually shrink that time to repair and we enable our teams to be more successful through context, we, we set them up to start growing a different metric that I'm, I'm very passionate about, and that's TTL, the time to learn. The less time we spend in the break-fix cycle, if we're smart with our teams, we can invest that time in analysis and readiness and really start setting ourselves up for future success while still delivering business value by reducing time to resolve. That's everything I have for you folks today. Uh, I'm Matthew Beckman. I hope you've enjoyed the talk. Uh, we are Victor Ops, and we're straight back there. You're welcome to stop by. I'll be there the rest of the afternoon. We can talk alerts, alert transformations, incident management, uh, or anything else that you think is interesting here at the show. Uh, please check us out on Twitter, uh, and I'm at Matthew Beckman on Twitter as well. Thank you.